I'm glad you're here, and I hope you're glad you're here. Today is Trunk or Treat this afternoon, and I hope that you are inviting some friends, family, folks that don't get to go to church. Maybe it's got some kids that come and see what Heartland's about as we uh, share in some outdoor things. It's going to be a little breezy, but it's going to be warm. And yeah, looking forward to that. Uh, the Oaks are going to start again. And you've got an announcement in your bulletin about that. And it says they're going to be having a meal. The turkey dressing and drinks will be provided. If you're coming to that, and I pray that you can, that you would, you need to bring a side dish to go along with that. Otherwise, it's going to be a pretty plain meal. <sighs> but if you would. Uh... And one very important announcement. Next Sunday, time changes. Please remember, because what happens? People drive in the driveway and we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> or you get here an hour, depending on if you can remember which way it's supposed to go. So next, uh, next Sunday, we're going to go backwards an hour fall back. So anyway, uh, please make a note of that. There are several other announcements in your bulletin and you can pay attention to those and ones that may refer to you. Lots of things coming up. I do have a note I would like to read from the Grounds family. Um, our dear friends, your outpouring of love and hospitality toward our family during our time of grief will never be forgotten. Words are not enough to express our gratitude. God will bless you for your kindness. The, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Bill and Judah Grounds. And, and that was quite a service that was here, and, and folks here at the church did an excellent job of preparing for that, and we do thank you as well for doing that. If you would, take your Bibles and let's turn to the book of Titus. And we're going to share, as Titus is encouraged by our Apostle Paul, as he's been charged with finishing the work. And I think that we need to be charged with finishing the work every day. How about you? Getting the work done. I don't think it's ever done. I think it will never be done. You know that we will never be done until Jesus returns. And our work, no matter where we are in life, isn't done as well. Whether we're able to do new things or whether we're getting to the point in life when we aren't as able to do as much as we used to, we are all in this battle together and there's work to be done. And without question... The most powerful thing that a Christian has is the power of prayer. And when we get to the point where we can't do anything else, there is always that opportunity to pray for those who need strengthened, for those who need the Spirit to convict them, for those who are doing the footwork of everyday life for the kingdom of God. The power of prayer is great. And Titus has been charged with finishing the work of the church. And Paul... As he charges this young man and gives him instruction, um, Titus has been traveling with him for a while, but he still writes in this letter some things that we all ought to know. I, I get, uh, oh, how should I say this? I get a little bit aggravated when somebody tells me something I already know like I don't know it. But why are you all looking at each other? <laughs> But once in a great while, and maybe more than that for me, I do learn something new that I thought I knew that I didn't know. Does that happen to you? And Paul writes this simple letter, but some of the things he says are just so deep in the wisdom of God. And so we're going to begin in chapter 2. It's really about verse 5 today, but we're going to begin in, in verse 2 or of chapter 2 of Titus. And as we've been uh, discussing each one of these parts of the beginning of what a church needs to be, I just hope that you, like myself, put my name in here. 
And even though I'm not an older lady, these characteristics of the older lady fit me. And even though you may not be an older man, they fit you. And you may not be young, old, young, doesn't matter, male or female. These things are the things of God. They need to be a part of our life. Some folks read these characteristics of the Christian that Paul's laying out to him, and they take it so seriously that they let it control their life. There's a huge danger in that. And the danger is that we chase away people because they look at us and like think to themselves, I could never live like them. I would never fit in with them, and I could never be a part of them. So when we read these, after we read them again, every bit of this is about me. It isn't about forcing someone else to be like me. It's just about me. Am I fitting the mold that Jesus wants me to have to be a part of His kingdom? Or am I trying to force other people into the same mold that I think they ought to be in? And when I do that, what happens? We chase them off. Jesus, on the other hand, and you've got to remember, all Scripture is inspired by God. Jesus, on the other hand, says, I don't really have any uh, issue with what day you go to church. He never dictates to us what we should wear. He never, ever tells us that we are to have certain things in our lives and other things we have to stay away from. He doesn't have a list of worldly things that he says you can or cannot do. What he says is this. Don't let sin reign in your life. And don't let anything come before your God. And through that, you have, we have all kinds of cultural things that we have to deal with. Some of the things that we're going to read here are cultural. Some are not. But they all center around whether or not I am letting God reign in my life. Whether He is king of my life. And that my life is right and I'm going to do the best I can to share Jesus. Not a way of life. Now sometimes sharing Jesus means there's things in our life that have to change. Sin can't be there. Sin has to be eradicated. It is the one thing that will send us to hell for eternity. But past that, we've got cultural things to deal with. I'm not going to be offensive. I don't want to be. That stumbling block is a major offense that will send us to hell. So we have to be very careful when we read things and then say, it's got to be exactly like this. I've seen that done in my own life. It doesn't work. Titus chapter 2 2 through 5. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and in love and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips or a slave to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the Word of God may not be dishonored. This is the second week in a row that we've read this. Last week we picked out the word sensible. That I have a sense of direction, the sense that I know I'm headed towards eternity. This morning in Sunday school we talked about those who were born with a sense of direction and those who are not. It's a very strange thing. For folks who have a sense of direction to, to not get why somebody else wouldn't know which way they were going is unfathomable. And those who have no idea where they're going, they can't figure out how folks who have that, where they get it. See, you either you got it or you don't. 
But a true sense of eternity comes from the power of the Holy Spirit, and we get it. That we're all headed for a destiny. And that's what we shared last week. That I keep my senses focused on eternity. Today I want to focus on something else. The last word of chapter 5. Or verse 5. Honor. Every one of these characteristics brings honor to a family. And honor to God. And honor is something that... Someone would say, I can, you, I can be proud because you've done an honorable thing. You've behaved in a manner that is worthy of the king. Uh, my folks were very adamant about teaching us manners while we were eating at home. My brother doesn't listen very well. And he still gets yelled at by dad regularly. But it was a big deal to my folks to teach us manners when you're eating. And it is a big deal, isn't it? Is it scriptural? No. But it's honorable. See, God has some things that He expects us to be honorable with. He expects us to raise our families and conduct our families in such a way that we will not dishonor Him. There are so many things that are dishonorable to our God, and we have to be so careful. Now, Paul so briefly runs over these things. I mean, we read that in what, 30 seconds or less? But that's a lifetime of learning if you break all those characteristics down one by one. I want to share with you one dishonorable thing this morning that we could share this week in an atmosphere of love, in an atmosphere of we're not condemning people. Thank you, Devin. We're not condemning people. We just want to share with you the truth. I would suspect if you leave your light on for this week's Halloween festival, maybe they've already done this here in Marion, I don't know, but there will be some more trick-or-treating stuff going on. There will be some here today. That you're going to see someone dressed up like a witch or a goblin. And they'll be here. And it's a great opportunity to kindly say to them, did you know this is real? That there really are witches? There's witches in the Bible? There are. And there are really demons in the Bible. God talks about it. It's a, it's a fact. And He also talks about then the good spirits. And what a great opportunity we have this time of year to discuss that. Because God's position is this. Anybody who deals with witchcraft or the occult in any way dealing with the powers of Satan is very dishonorable. Matter of fact, God uses this next word worse, abominable to him, through abomination. And so it is easy to make that step, to not make those folks feel bad, but say, hey, you know, God really wants to teach us about the spiritual life. Don't go into how bad witches are. Don't go into how bad goblins are. Share with them, the spiritual life is real. Would you like to know? It's so difficult when we talk about dishonoring God, because the first thing we think about is a big old man with a stick who's going to discipline us when we get out of line. And yes, God could be that God. That's not who He wants to be. And that's not who he wants his people to be. Back in the first letter to the young man Timothy, turn over there if you will. Go over to chapter 6, the very first verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6, the very first verse. Paul uses this word servant. Or maybe your Bible might say slave, and some of your Bibles may say bondservant. And they all can be similar 
in meaning. They all have a little different meaning. A slave would have been forced into service. A bond servant would just volunteer and say, I'm going to be your slave with no pay. I'm going to work for you for nothing. And a servant's just a servant, whether they get paid or not. But 1 Timothy, in chapter 6, verse 1, did you find that back there, Eli? Put her up there. That way I don't have to turn to it. Let all who are under the yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine may not be spoken against or dishonored. Worthy of all honor, so the name of God and our doctrine may, na may not be spoken against. I signed up to be a slave and I didn't know it. Nobody told me that when I took the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior, that I was going to give up my agenda in life for His. That wasn't mentioned to me. I was a young man. I guess they thought I didn't have an agenda. I had a big agenda. What's for lunch? Can I ride my bike after school and get away somewhere? I had all kinds of agendas. Do you guys remember those agendas? They weren't very important, were they? But uh, they didn't share that with me for a reason. I wasn't ready for that. They knew I was ready to have Jesus as Lord and Savior in my life. I'd been asking those questions, and you probably have too. And I hope you have answered, got those answered and responded to those. But those folks didn't, they knew I wasn't ready for that. They knew I hadn't matured enough as a young man, and certainly not as a Christian, to be able to deal with the thought that I'm a slave. I'm a bond servant. The book of James, very first verse. The book of 1 Timothy, very first verse. The book of 2 Peter, the very first verse. Every one of those men called themselves a bond servant. At first they didn't know that. But later on they come to realize that what they were doing, what we are doing, is upholding the honor of our God as we walk through life. Let's turn over to the book of James. Jesus' brother, I think, gives us such good insight in chapter 4. As we talk about honor and how a bond servant or a servant of God is to conduct our lives, uh, I think his perspective, and of course written through the aspiration of God, gives us a little different hint of really what I need to be doing. Um, a brother who was a non, not believe, an unbeliever, a brother who was younger than Jesus, probably thinking the older brother got everything. I had a little bit of that plague in my life with my two younger brothers. Um, but we got over that. And James got over it too. When he seen his brother Jesus, who was raised in his same home, come to life after he had been crucified, it changed his life. And it's changed mine, and it's changed many of yours, the knowledge that Jesus is life, and he's alive. And he left this earth alive, and he's coming back alive. And He's coming back for those whose spirits are alive in Him. And James writes to us in this next to the end of his, we call it a chapter, in chapter 4 of his book. We're going to read quite a bit of this. Because he talks about honor. Verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? It is, it is not the source, your pleasures that wage war in your members. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask, but you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses. 
Do you not know that the friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Very first thing that is dishonorable to God and to the kingdom is when we place the world in higher regard than we do the kingdom of God. It is horribly a dishonor. I've been guilty of it in my life. I didn't know any better. I wasn't mature enough to know the difference. I was following what I thought I was supposed to be doing, chasing after things of the world instead of things of the kingdom. And it only comes with maturity that the Spirit brings us and with our hungers and thirsting for righteousness that we get into God's Word and realize there is nothing in this world that I'm taking with me except you. The folks I get to know as brothers and sisters in Christ are going to go. Everything else is going to burn. I think we have to hear that a few times in our Christian walk to get it figured out. And here James just bluntly, is that not as blunt as it gets? Just bluntly says, hey, if you think the world is more uh, exciting and it's better than the kingdom of God, you're making a grave mistake. I learned it, but I learned it hard. James, through the power of the Spirit, is trying to teach us. You don't have to learn it that way. You know, part of that older men teaching younger boys, part of them older women teaching younger girls, something we need to teach. Amen. The world will kill us. Let's go on. Verse 5. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose that He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us? He, but He, verse 6, gives us a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God. There is the enslavement. Submitting myself to God. And when you put that back with what Paul is telling to the man Titus, that all these things that we need to have in our lives that he gives this brief little picture of there in the second chapter of Titus, and he comes down and says you need to have these things in your life so you don't dishonor God, well it all begins with saying, I'm going to put in my life because I am a slave to the Master, the things He wants me to do. I have to make up my mind to do it. All of us do. It just doesn't happen. We've got to say to ourselves, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to talk that way. And I'm not going to act that way. It's about me. And then it's about teaching what is dishonorable and honorable to God. I, my favorite Old Testament scriptures are found in Nehemiah and Ezra because those two men give us a picture of today's church. Now there's a lot of great things in the Old Testament. But when you look back to Ezra's letter and he says that he had sat down and decided that he was going to study, he was going to practice, and he was going to teach the Word of God. It was a decision that he had to say to himself, I'm going to be a servant. I'm not going to let anything else in my life reign in my life. And I'm going to be an honorable to a God who needs honored. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil's always after somebody. And before Christ became a part of your life, he didn't chase you. Didn't chase me. He had me. And the minute you mention the word Jesus, and the minute you start considering making yourself line up with these words, Satan's out there chasing you. When I was young... Er, I was afraid of the dark. 
How many of you get afraid of the dark? I do. I'm not scared of the dark anymore. I don't like it. Do any of you like it? I hope not. If you come to our old coal mine building where we have as our shop now, and you turn the lights off and you walk through there and tell me you're not scared, you're good. I'll, I'll pay money to watch because we have bats. And those bats come to visit with you when you turn the lights off. And I've seen grown kids at that place who thought they were as tough as nails scream like little girls. <laughs> Satan loves fear. He wants us to be scared. He doesn't ever want us to get empowered by the Spirit to the point where we say, I know who I serve and I am a servant of the Lord God and you can't touch me. But that's exactly where we are when we're in Christ. And we know those things over and over again. Jesus says, I have given you the most powerful thing that I can give you, and that is the spirit that lives within you. And we read this verse, and we read verses like it over in 1 John, where it says, Satan cannot touch you. Cannot touch you. 1 John 5.18 Satan cannot touch you if you are indeed born of God that you have given your life to Christ that have been baptized into Christ you've been given that rebirth the, the great blessing of the Spirit Satan's power is gone and only if we allow him to come back will Satan have an opportunity and bring dishonor to God when we let Him have that opportunity. I didn't put two and two together very well, but uh, one of our young ladies in the Sunday school class mentioned that, or maybe the young man, I can't remember, somewhere around 80. I'm, I don't know. In God's eyes, that's really young. I don't know, I'm just teasing. Somebody mentioned in Sunday school this new medium show coming on where some woman talks to dead people. And she's coming to Cape Girardeau. I've heard this on the radio, and she's trying to get people to come. Hey, all that sounds really cool. God hates it. It's devilish. It's abomination. We are called as Christians never to mess with dead folks. Never. The witch of Endor called Samuel out of the grave. Saul talked to the man. It was real. Saul says, Samuel, I need you. He goes, well, you can talk to me tomorrow. You're going to be dead, you and all your boys. And it happened the next day. Saul and his sons all died on the battle. That's real. And it's not to be monkeyed with. It brings dishonor to our God. Verse 8, <clears throat> we're going to read down through verse 12. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy, in, or your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. We sing that song, and it says, He will lift you up. And He will. Because that son and daughter of His, when... We, me, realize the place I'm at. And God says, yes, you're finally listening to me. That's where he needs us to get, to where we're listening to him. And he'll lift us up from that place. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against his brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are to you to judge your neighbors? We go back to Titus. And we go to that list that we read. Some of those things are cultural, 
that I can't take a person and make them, stuff them into the mold that I think they should live under and in. But I can take that same person and just share with them Jesus and share with them the truth of eternity and share with them that God's love is unconditional no matter what we've done or where we've been. And that His mission has always been to restore that relationship and to bring us back that when He judges Satan and condemns him to his final destiny, that we don't go with him. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ living in us. To share the good news with Jesus. Not condemning people and not judging them. But just let them know that the separation is caused by sin. And that sin is forgivable in the blood of Christ. Today as we get ready to leave, we're going to offer an invitation to make that happen today for you. If you've not made that choice to make Jesus Lord and Savior in life and to be born again in the waters of baptism. We would pray if that needs to happen or can happen, that would today for you. And for us Christians who have made that choice, I pray that we read Titus again. And think about, do these fit me? Am I trying to reach out to those who need Jesus as Lord in their life? Am I the servant who will bring honor to my God? Let's stand and sing.